All right. Uh, so let's try to start again, uh, lecture two. So the new problem today that we're going to address is, can we solve AX equals B for any vector B? All right, so I give you a matrix A, and I tell you, can you find an X so that AX equals B, okay? Before what we did is we discussed only the left-hand side, and we said AX is a linear combination of the columns of A, so now I'm gonna give you a B and I'll say, can you find an X? Uh, before I go to any details, let me say that the remaining of the lecture today and the lecture maybe on Monday, uh, it will be a brief overview of answering this question, but I will not tell you everything in detail because I'm gonna come back to these topics. So I want you basically to have enough information so you can start working on the homework, but a lot of the details will come in, uh, in uh, follow-up lectures, okay? Because there will be a lot of things that I will be missing today in, uh, in the presentation. Okay, so um, technical difficulties are always an issue here. Okay. Okay, um, so the, uh, can you actually, let me put all of these things up. We said that AEX is a combination of the columns of A. Okay, so can you think what needs to happen, what type of B do you like to have so that AX equals B has a solution? I repeat, AX is a combination of the columns of, uh, of A. So what types of B do we need to have so that AX equals B has a solution? I mean, particularly we are asking, can you find a combination of the columns of A so that AX equals B. So what special needs to happen to the columns of A to be able to have a solution for any B? And I don't need theory here, just simple words. You know, so we're taking combination of the columns of A and we're asking, you know, under what circumstances that problem has a solution for any B? What special thing needs to happen to the columns of A or to the linear combination of the columns of A. They need to be able to do what? If this is a 3D problem, fill the entire 3D space. And again, I don't need any mathematics. Fill, you know, in, you know, whatever that means. We need to be able basically to guarantee that when we take combination of these columns, that combination covers the whole space, can generate any vector in the 3D space, okay? So in many ways, you already know the answer. We just need to, be, to put it in more formal uh, type of um, uh, setting. If uh, AX covers, basically gives us this linear combination of the columns of A is capable to represent the whole, let's say, three-dimensional space, then this problem has a solution regardless of what you put there for B. So we're, we'll try to do some examples, uh, starting with uh, uh, a very simple uh, three by three matrix. Remember that I want you to think of matrices being derived by linear combination of vectors. That's a new concept, right? You usually think of uh, matrices and then you say you define vectors. So what I want to do is I want to start with three vectors that I call them here U, V, and W, and I take a linear combination of those, x1 times u, x2 times v, x3 times w. Obviously you can see that this um, uh, linear uh, combination of the three vectors is really x1, x2 minus x1, and x3 minus x2. And if you want to write this in a matrix form, uh, you are gonna have one here, minus one, one, minus one, one, right? And I call this matrix the difference matrix. Can you see from where the name comes? Why do I call this the difference matrix? What is the effect of this matrix A on a vector X? That makes me to call this a difference matrix. I mean, you notice here, what do I do, right? Uh, okay, the first element is X1 because I start from somewhere. Uh, when you multiply the second row with this vector, what do you get? X2 minus X1, 
and then x3 minus x2, you take the differences of the x's. So this is what I call a difference matrix. The name may sound uh, not relevant uh, in the lecture today, but you will see later on that this matrix is extremely important in numerical methods. You can think of finite differences, you know, if you've seen this in, in the past. So it's a very special matrix. So linear combinations of u, v, and w, all right? And uh, so that way I form this difference matrix A times x. And um, all right, so I am actually, you know, let me go directly to the following problem. Let's say I give you a B and I'm asking you for A being the difference matrix, can you find me an X so that AX equal to B? In other ways, is the problem for any B solvable? Can you find me an X given a B where A is the difference matrix? So uh, this is the new question we need to pose, which combination of the vectors U, V, and W produces basically the B that I gave you? So if I give you, um, let's do one case here. This is the system of equations. I write it explicitly, you remember our difference AX produces these differences. You can immediately see actually you can solve the system of equations without uh, being concerned what B is because X1 is equal to B1, X2 will be B2 plus B1, and X3 will be B1 plus B2 plus B3. So this problem actually has a solution and it doesn't care what B is. We're lucky basically, it not only has a solution, but you notice something? If the metric say that we had here was a difference metric because it formed this difference between the x's, can you see what the metric say minus inverse of a does? What name should we, uh, how should we call uh, a inverse? Do you have any name for it? I mean, before we were taking differences, look now at this metric say minus one, what does it do? Sums. All right, now you may say uh, big deal, uh, you know, one is differences, another one is summation, but actually the concept here is very philosophical. It's the same thing as you say, I differentiate and I integrate. As a matter of fact, uh, I will show you in a little while that there is one-to-one -one analog between differentiation and integration and this difference and summation metrics, but right now, Effectively, what I have done is, for this trivial problem, there is a unique solution that is given by that. So uh, uh, this inverse matrix you can see from this exact solution is really this matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Formally, I have not defined what an inverse matrix is, so I use your background from earlier courses, all right? In some sense, we will come back. Uh, basically, the inverse matrix uh, is the matrix that allows us to go from B to X if it exists. And in this particular case, it exists. And it is this uh, sum matrix, if you like, or addition matrix that is given uh, like that by simple algebra. Okay, so here is the analog that uh, I mentioned with uh, uh, differentiation and integration. And uh, I want to throw it now because in essence, I want you to think that linear algebra is very, very powerful. It allows you actually to think of many of the things you learned in calculus in the context of linear algebra, something you have never done before, okay? So let me see, what is the relation of linear algebra and calculus? So let's take, in linear algebra, you operate with discrete things, right? We had the vector x, a matrix A, uh, three by three. So let me actually take x to be a continuous function of t, all right, and um, uh, address the problem basically dx over dt equal to some vector b that is also a function of t. So I'm gonna take an example where x of t is equal to t square. All right, x of t equal to t square. What's the derivative of t square? 2t. Two two t. Two t. Um, so I claim that the difference matrix that we had before, it's analogous to the derivative of uh, uh, x of t, which is two times t. So let's see if this is the case, or if it is not. 
So let's take t equal one, two, and three, all right? So you remember x is t squared. So ax here, I'm gonna put the squares, one, four, and nine. So if you take the differences of one, four, and nine, what do you get? You get one, four minus one, you get three, nine minus four, you get five. But the derivative of x being t squared is two times t, and two times t is two times two, four, and six. It's not one, three, five. Something is wrong there. So when I say the difference matrix is analogous to the derivative, we're missing something there. It's not quite analogous. They don't give you quite the same answer. Do you know how I make a differentiation to give me exactly the same answers as the, uh, the difference matrix? What I have to do to correct it? What would you like this derivative to be so that when you differentiate and you compute this at equal one, two, and three, you get the same answers as we get here? Remember, if you take the derivative two times t, calculate it at one, two, and three, what do you get? You get two, four, and six, but here we have one, three, and five. So it would have been really analogous if instead of two t, we had what? Two t minus minus one. How do we get 2t minus 1 when you take derivatives? That would be illegal in the calculus. But when you do numerical approximations, you know how you get it? When you use a backward difference approximation of the derivative. Have you heard of that b before as an approximation? Right? When you have a function and you want to take a derivative, you can use a backward difference. There are many other ways of doing it. So uh, I write this as an approximation of the derivative. The interval between the t's is equal to one. So I use x at t plus one minus x at t. And you can see immediately I get two t minus one. Now, on the big picture for the lecture today, this may sound irrelevant, but I wanted to throw this up because somehow we will be able, once we finish linear algebra, to go to continuous things and discuss uh, differential equations literally by using things we learned in linear algebra. Right? So linear algebra is really a good point to start rather than doing calculus and then linear algebra. All right, so let's go back to our problem with a, uh, uh, you know, and I am going to, so you remember when I use, uh, if I go back, when I use this, um, when I use these vectors u, v, and w, the problem had the unique solution for any b, okay? So effectively, these vectors u, v, and w fill the whole three-dimensional space. That's why I was able to get a solution for any b. So what I want to do is I want to take three different vectors now and see how things may change. So let me take the original vectors u and v that you see there. All right, these are the original vectors u and v. But instead of w, take a vector w star that is minus 1, 0, and 1. And you notice now when uh, I take the linear combination of the vectors u, v, and w, what actually you get is you get x1 minus x3, x2 minus x1, and x3 minus x2, all right? This is what you get. So now what we need to answer the question is, if I give you a b, can you find a, an x? a unique x so that ax equal to b. What do you think? Look at the vectors u, v, and w, and tell me what is different with the selection of this w star on this example. What is very unique about this w star? It's already written there, but can you see that w star is what? It says here is minus u. You put minus u, it's minus 1, minus v. So if, uh, for the second element, it will be minus the minus one, all right? Uh, uh, let me see, minus u minus v. So yes, so it will be minus the minus one, which is one, minus one will be zero, all right? And then uh, this is zero, minus v will be one. So can you see that w star is what? What is the relation what can we say about W star 
uh, in the context of the plane of the vectors u and v. So if I have the two vectors u and v on some plane, right, what can you tell me about w star? It's on, it's on that plane. So basically all the vectors that I can generate by linear combination of u, v, and w star can only be vectors square on that plane. So if you give me a b that is outside that plane, there is no way I can generate it with vectors on the plane. The word that we use, and, and I will give special lecture on this uh, possibly next week, is that these vectors u, v, and w star are, what, uh, what's the name we use for them? Linear dependent, right? And linear dependent, again, common sense language means that one vector, it's a combination of the other two vectors. So can we solve in this case? So obviously we know there is an issue, right? That uh, somehow we cannot fill the whole space. So you anticipate difficulties if you give me any B and that B uh, it's arbitrary. There is no way you can find a solution. Can actually tell me for what B you can find a solution to this problem? What special needs to be the case for that B to get me a solution? We said that all combinations of these vectors, they're on a plane. So what B do I need to give you to get me a solution? Where that B has to be? On that plane, okay? So if the B is outside the plane, you cannot do anything. And uh, so let's do some, uh, so uh, in this case, I call the matrix C rather than A. So this is the matrix C. Uh, and um, before I discuss anything about the inverse of the matrix, let's uh, consider the case that I give you a vector B that is zero, zero, zero. Can you find a solution for this case for X if the vector is zero, zero, zero? So if you put this up on the first equation, then effectively what you have x1 minus x3 is 0, x2 minus x1 is 0, x3 minus x2 is 0. So what's the solution of that? x1 equal to x3 equal to x3 equal to anything, okay? So uh, effectively, I have infinite solutions in this problem. I have infinite solutions. Now, let me... Uh, Convince you that, the, you know, even though we have not defined what an inverse of a matrix is, in this case, the inverse doesn't exist, all right? So think of the problem C times X equal to zero. With this calculation here at the end of the slide, we already have concluded that there are infinite X's so that C times X equal to zero, correct? Now suppose the inverse exists. Suppose you can invert this matrix C. So don't you think that then X has to be the inverse of C times the zero vector? And any matrix times the zero vector is what? Zero. But how can you go from something that is zero to something that can be anything, any C, C, C? The inverse matrix cannot exist because it's like saying multiply this inverse matrix with a zero vector and get something that is not zero. That's not possible. And actually, this is a very good way to think on when the inverse exists, right? Uh, so in this case, we have uh, uh, infinite solutions, okay? Uh, and, um, and the inverse in this problem doesn't exist. And basically, the cause of all of this is because the vectors u, v, and w star, they are what we call dependent. One of them depends on the other two. And uh, uh, now you can take another case. You can take a vector uh, one, three, and five. So if you set this one, three, and five, uh, we have issues here because take the sum of the three components on the left-hand side. If you sum all of these three components, what do you get? You get a zero and sum all of these three components, you get nine. There's no way this can, be a so, uh, can have a solution. There's no way you can find an X, right, if the B is this vector one, three, uh, and five. So in this case, for a vector B that is one, three, and five, there is no uh, solution at all. Okay, so effectively for a three by three matrix, um, just to summarize, 
uh, if the three vectors basically don't lie on the same plane, uh, obviously we they are independent vectors. Obviously we can invert the matrix that has columns, these vectors u, v, uh, uh, and w. And obviously there is a solution for an arbitrary b. And the other case where uh, the three vectors are on a plane, uh, they are dependent vectors. If, if they form the columns of a matrix, you cannot invert that matrix. Uh, if you cannot invert means AX equal B either has no solution or many solutions, okay? And again, we will come back to all of this, but I wanted you to see these concepts uh, early on as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, so we can introduce ourselves to, uh, to this type of things. Uh, by the way, you remember uh, the, if you take the linear combinations of the vectors u, v, and, and uh, w star, uh, I had this equation on the slide before. If you take, um, we said the sum of this, this comes from uh, c times x, you get this. When you sum all of this, you get zero. So effectively, this plane, you can define it by uh, the equation b1 plus b2 plus b3 equal to zero. So effectively, the only b's where you have solutions, as you told me a while ago, are the b's that lie on that plane, and those b's have to satisfy b1 plus b2 plus b3 equal to zero. Okay, all right. I, um, so obviously, uh, these vectors uh, that uh, form, you know, they are on the plane here, this u, v, and w star, I can throw a new concept. They form what I call a two-dimensional subspace of R cubed, all right? Uh, I haven't really defined what spaces are, but, you know, you can, uh, I'm throwing the concept. This is really a plane in three dimensions, and I call this plane a subspace of the three-dimensional uh, R-cube space, okay? We will formally give a definition of this uh, later on um, uh, as we move. Okay. So let me uh, go and uh, uh, give you some formal definitions of uh, independent vectors and um, what I call a basis. So we discuss about these three vectors. Uh, if we put them as columns of the matrix A, uh, these three vectors, uh, look to be independent. You cannot write really one as a combination of the other two. You can see here, uh, if you take two vectors, these two are on the plane x, y. The other one is normal to that plane, so obviously these vectors are independent. So in this case, you can solve ax equal, uh, equal to b. Okay, uh, so in, in some way, the concept here is these vectors u of v and w uh, can generate the whole three-dimensional space. But there's something more important. If you go and add a fourth vector, that fourth vector, it will not really be needed to fill the three-dimensional space. So if I give you another vector here in three dimensions, uh, will it be, I mean, obviously I can say the four vectors fill the whole space, but do you need the four vectors to do that? I mean, if you're in three dimensions, how many vectors do you need? Just again, you need three, okay? So if I give you a fourth vector, the fourth vector has to be a linear combination of these three vectors. So basically, these three vectors form the maximum number of independent vectors that fill the space. I repeat this. They are the maximum number, which is three, of independent vectors that fill the space. But let me ask you uh, a simple question. Are these, ve are these vectors that fill the three-dimensional space unique? Or can you find me some other three independent vectors? Yeah, means you can find others. Well, I mean, some may say, no, they are unique. So you can find others. For example, the obvious one, right, will be one, zero, zero, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, okay? So they're not unique, but the bottom line is there are three independent vectors, okay? That's the maximum number that you can find in three dimensions that fill the space, 
and this is what we call the basis for the space. So the basis basically is the maximum number of independent vectors that you need to fill that three-dimensional space. Okay. Um, and you notice uh, we have done actually something else that is interesting to connect this basis that forms the whole of the three-dimensional space. We also have looked at this problem by taking these vectors and making them the columns of a matrix AEX. So when you say they form a basis, if you make them columns of A and you form AEX equal to B, this is saying that it's a basis. It's equivalent to say that AEX equal to B has a solution for any B. The two things don't seem to be related to each other, right? One is, can I fill the whole space? The other one is, can I solve AX equal B? But they are the same problem. They're exactly the same problem, okay? All right, so um, I am gonna give you a formal uh, definition of linear independence of vectors, but the down to earth answer is, uh, if any vector in a com in, you know, can be written as a combination of other vectors, they are linear dependent. Uh, if you look so for linear independence, uh, if you take a combination of the vectors u, v, and w to be equal to zero, uh, for these vectors to be independent, the only combination that will give you zero will be uh, with coefficient zero, okay? If there is another solution where, for example, u plus v plus w star equal to zero, like we, what we did in our example, then they are dependent. You should not be able to write one vector as a combination of the other ones if you're gonna claim that these vectors are independent. All right, don't need any of this, just the definition I, I mentioned. Okay, so let me do some uh, very, very rapid, uh, uh, simple things about uh, algebra in matrices. Uh, and I uh, will obviously advise you to look more carefully in the notes uh, for the rest, but there is nothing uh, new here. Uh, so we denote remember matrices with capital uh, bold letters. Um, when you compare matrices, you have to be sure they have the same size, all right? So we call two matrices A to be equal to B when all the corresponding elements are the same, okay? So don't go and compare a three by two matrix with a two by three, right? The two matrices, if you're going to compare them, they have to be of the same size and we call them equal when Aij equal to Bij. Um, we define the summation of matrices as the matrix that has components, the sum of the corresponding components. And again, you don't sum matrices that they don't have the same size, okay? They need to have the same size. It's illegal to do anything else. Uh, the product now, uh, well, the product with a scalar is uh, very simple. Uh, if you multiply with the scalar C and matrix A, it's like multiplying every component with that scalar C. And that scalar C can be a real number, and as we will see later on when we do Fourier uh, methods, it uh, can also be a complex number. Uh, there is your standard rules that look sort of the common sense uh, rules for uh, matrices and addition of matrices. And, um, so obviously there is a zero matrix that's fundamental and there is uh, a minus A matrix defined by the property C and D. And then I have uh, this uh, commutative uh, property for addition. You can basically interchange A and B and write this B plus A. The answer is the same. Or you, know, you can have this associative rule for addition between matrices and again, uh, you know, move the parentheses from A plus B to B plus C. So if you add this first or add B and C first, you get the same answer. Again, nothing you need to remember because these are the common sense uh, things. And you have basically the same properties uh, when uh, you uh, do multiplication with scalars. And again, I, uh, nothing uh, new there. The product of the matrices, uh, it's uh, uh, less trivial, okay? Uh, when can I multiply? If I have two matrices, if A is M by N and B is R by P, when can I multiply A times B? Yeah. 
what is the constraint when you multiply a times b? So basically, the number of columns of the first matrix has to be equal to what? The number of rows of the second matrix. So if a, b is defined, do not assume that b times a is defined. All right, if a, b is defined, do not assume that b, a is defined, which means when you do algebra with matrices, don't start moving a's and b's around thinking that life is good because uh, that's how you will get in trouble. Okay, uh, so A and B, this uh, N has to match with uh, this N, the number of columns has to match with the number of rows, and the resulting matrix is a matrix, if you multiply M times N with N times P, you get a matrix M times uh, P. And um, here is uh, your, one of the ways that uh, I do multiplication, you know, any way that uh, you know uh, is fine. Uh, effectively to find Let's say in this case, the element C31 of the product of A and B, what you need to do is multiply the third row with the first column, right? Third, three means third row of the first matrix with the first column. And really what you do is you take the inner product of the corresponding column vectors there, okay? Uh, the third row with the first column gives you the element C31. Literally, I would like to do algebra in this course by using vectors rather than writing explicitly things in terms of components, okay? I would like to use uh, vectors rather than uh, using components. All right, and uh, uh, here is a, one example, another example of matrix multiplication that uh, you can consult uh, when you read the slides. Notice in this case, right, uh, A is three by three, and B is three by four. So in this case, B times A is not defined, right? So that's a nice example. A, B is defined and you see it there, but B times A is not defined. And let me show you a very nice uh, example from Professor Strang's book, okay? Take A to be this nice matrix and B this nice matrix two by two. You know, if I multiply A times B, I get zero, the zero matrix. Look carefully, is that the zero matrix, right? First element will be minus one plus one, zero, then minus 100 plus 100, zero. Looks like the zero, but if you multiply B times A, what do you get? Look at the big difference, right? A times B gives you the zero matrix. B times A, it gives you anything but the zero matrix. Huge difference. You know what that means? If the product of A and B is zero, don't assume that A is zero or B is zero. I repeat, if A times B is zero, don't assume that A is zero or that B is zero, all right? Uh, and obviously do not assume that B times A is zero. You have to be very careful with multiplication. Uh, so, you know, in, before we discuss about uh, these uh, different properties of uh, matrix addition uh, and um, uh, uh, also multiplying uh, with scalars. We can do the same properties now for multiplication. Um, and um, we have an associative uh, rule for multiplication. So uh, if you multiply three matrices, you can do the multiplication first of B and C and uh, multiply them by A on the left or you can do first a multiplication of A and B and then multiply with uh, C. And of course you can have this uh, distribution when it comes to um, uh, multiplication uh, with the addition coming here. So if you have to take the product of A and B with C, you can actually distribute this by first doing the multiplication A times C and then uh, B times C. Again, uh, you notice in none of these properties we reverse the order of multiplication, right? So the order of multiplication is kept uh, uh, as is. So let me, uh, uh, so let me, so l let me remind you something. When you multiply A times X, uh, one of the ways that uh, I told you to think of A times uh, a vector X is a, a linear combination of what? What is A times X? We said one of the ways is to think A times X as a combination of, of the columns. So think of a matrix A, right? So you have, uh, you know, 
column one, column two, so call it, let's call it A1, A2, whatever, and then times sex. So literally, you can take the inner product of each of these vectors with axis, looks like an inner product, but it's really a combination of the columns. So I can extend this idea and write the product AB. Uh, I can write B uh, as B1, B2, BP, where these are the columns of B. So then immediately you can see that the first column of AB is what? Is operating A on the first column of B. So you can think if you're gonna do this in a, in a big computer, right, and you want to automate multiplication, you can actually compute all of this independently and simultaneously. This is very essential. This is how we're gonna do operations with multiplication. Uh, you don't think of multiplying all of uh, A with all of B. No, you'll be multiplying A with the first column of B, with the second column of B, and all of these are independent, so you can actually perform this uh, on different computer processors. All right, the transpose of a matrix, I don't really have to tell you much. Uh, basically, um, you, uh, 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 you, know, you uh, exchange elements uh, across the diagonal, if you like, so instead of having here A12, you have A21, AM1. Here, instead of having A21, you have A12. So this is the transpose of a matrix uh, A, okay? The elements that you see here are elements of A, not of A transpose. They are elements of A. What I want you to pay attention is to this uh, wonderful property on uh, the end that the transpose of AB uh, is somehow B transpose A transpose. I'm not going to prove it, but everything we have said up to now, it's sufficient to actually prove this. So I can easily assign you this as a homework, okay? So the transpose of AB is B transpose A transpose. This is extremely fundamental uh, property for the transpose of the product. Um, symmetric matrices definition, when the transpose of A is equal to A, we call this a symmetric matrix. So AIJ is the same as AJI. And anti-symmetric or skew matrix uh, is one where A transpose is equal to minus A. And uh, you notice the diagonal elements of a skew symmetric matrix, they're zero. How can you have A transpose equal to minus A and the diagonal not being zero, right? Because you're changing the sign there. So obviously the diagonal elements have to be zero. So a few examples, this is a three by three symmetric matrix, you can see. It doesn't matter what you have in the diagonal, but the off-diagonal elements are uh, uh, matching. So the AI, A, uh, uh, one, two, and A21, and A13, and A31, uh, they all match. And this is a skew symmetric matrix. Here the diagonal is required to be equal to zero. Um, so let me go through these examples. Uh, we will have special matrices. Uh, this is upper triangular matrices. This is an upper triangular matrix in two by two. So the only non-zero elements are in the diagonal and above the diagonal, all right, in these matrices. And these are lower triangular matrices. Let me say something extremely important. The fact that most uh, we can do a lot of difficult problems with linear algebra, especially using the computer. It has a lot to do with the fact that in practical problems, a lot of the matrices we get have some structure on them. So a lot of times we are lucky that the matrices look like that. If they don't, uh, we are messed up, okay? Uh, and uh, when you come with nice algorithms to do very complicated operations in linear algebra, these algorithms have to explore the structure of the matrices if one exists, okay? And uh, here you see some elementary ways of uh, uh, these matrices with, uh, that they are either lower or upper triangular. Uh, and of course you can have a diagonal matrix uh, where the only elements are uh, in the uh, diagonal. That's the best matrix of all. Actually we're gonna spend literally uh, 
two or three lectures, maybe even more, to tell you how to take any metrics, uh, even non-square matrices, and try to force them to become diagonal. What is the idea? Is because if something is diagonal, everything is so simple. So can we force matrices to become diagonal? Okay. So this is not just um, a theoretical concept, right? We need to be able to uh, see why there are benefits of having a diagonal matrix and then see, you know, maybe we will pose the following question. If you give me a matrix, you may ask me, Professor, what is the nearest diagonal matrix to the matrix that I gave you? Now, when I say nearest, we are going to have to define what that means, and that will come in a later lecture. Okay? Uh, now, so if you have uh, a diagonal matrix and all the diagonal elements are the same, sort of the matrix, uh, that's as easy as you can uh, see. That's the only time that actually uh, when you multiply any matrix A with a diagonal matrix that has all the elements the same, you can actually reverse the order of multiplication because really these products are really multiplying with a, uh, with a scalar, okay? Uh, that's trivial. And of course, uh, you will see a lot in the lecture uh, notes and in your textbooks that uh, this uh, identity matrix, remember the identity matrix is a matrix that has once in the diagonal, not once everywhere. Once in the diagonal, right? Once in the diagonal, once in the diagonal. Okay, um, I mentioned uh, we still have two minutes to go, don't run. So I mentioned that we will do a few things that are ahead of our schedule because I want you to see the concept so I can start giving you some homework while I go back and cover a lot of details. So the concept of a rank of a matrix is literally going to come five lectures down the road, but I want you to know about it now. Don't have time to wait, okay? So these lectures, you will see them in very fine details down the road. But the concept is so simple, I want to throw it at you now. So uh, the rank of a matrix, it says here by, you know, the, this one of the definitions is the maximum number of linearly independent row vectors in A. So you look at the rows of A, they're vectors, right? They're row vectors, and you're asking how many of these vectors are independent? That number, I call it the rank of the matrix A. Okay? Uh, now, uh, there is something very interesting, that if you actually start manipulating the rows, uh, but by either changing which row is first, which is second, or taking linear combinations of the rows, can you guess that the number of independent rows doesn't change? If I start combining rows together, the maximum number of independent rows will never change, right? This is what we call elementary row operations, okay? And they include operations such as, you know, if you change the order of the rows, you multiply with constants, or you add or subtract rows. The number of independent rows doesn't change, okay? And in this case, we say, if you change, if you do all of these operations on a metric, the metrics that you get is what we call row equivalent to the original metrics, has the same rank because the number of independent rows does not change. Um, so row equivalent matrices have the same rank, and I have to stop there so you don't tell me that I take a Friday minute out of your time. It's 11.20. Please uh, check uh, the website for the course because our room is going to change on Monday, okay? Our room is going to change. It's gonna be on the same building. I don't remember, I think it's 101, but uh, check the website for a new room. So I'll see you on Monday. And maybe I will post the homework this weekend, but it will not be due until the following week. Following week means not next week, maybe next Monday or Wednesday, okay? But I may post it this week. <laughs>